How's it going and welcome to No Fun Allowed's guide series on Curse of Strahd, a 5th edition module. In today's video we'll be covering Death House. This place definitely lives up to its name. Of course there is going to be a ton of spoilers so players do not watch this, but DMs that want that added insight, go ahead and stick around because we have a lot to cover. So here it is, the Death House. This place has been covered to death. <laughs> It's been covered to death by a whole bunch of other content creators, and if you go to the Reddits and the Discords and every other Curse of Strahd YouTuber, they have their own unique spin on this thing. What I'm going to be covering here is not necessarily a unique spin, but just covering, does this belong in your campaigns? If it does belong in your campaigns, how are we going to implement it? And what exactly are we going to get out of it? So first off, this is an introductory adventure to Curse of Strahd. Supposedly, you can run Curse of Strahd where they get swept up into the mist, and then this is the first thing that they come across. So they get swept up into the Death House, and then as level 1 characters, they grind their way through this place and make it out the other end. Of course, if you run this for level 1 PCs, you are going to have dead PCs. It is inevitable. It is statistically impossible that level 1 PCs would be able to get through some of these encounters alive. There's just so much going on. There's in fights where they go up against ghouls, then there's fights where they go up against Spectre, and they go up against the Shambling Mound. These fights are just absolutely TPKs in the making. I, of course, have already done a video on Death in the Lands of Barovia, and that's something to consider is, if you want to start off this campaign with a whole bunch of dead PCs but them coming back to life, that's fine. Another way you can run it is you could run this as a classic funnel where you give the players a whole bunch of characters and a whole bunch of characters die and the few surviving characters then end up becoming the group. There is a lot of different ways you approach this. I'm going to break it down into several brackets here on why you would want to run this for your campaigns. First off, you should run Death House if you have a group of players that have never experienced death and you want them to feel that sting if only for a little bit. Whether you make that a permanent death or if you have it where they come back to life. But having PCs die right there in the beginning can be a great way to showcase how dreadful and dreary the lands of Barovia are. The second reason to run Death House is so that your players earn it. They earn that level 3. Because at the end of this adventure, they walk out of Death House, they go into the village of Barovia, bam, they are level 3. If you want them to truly work for it, if you want them to overcome a challenge, if you want to give them that hill to climb, then this is a way to do it. Because they are truly going to come out of it the other end stronger because of the experiences that they made during this whole terrible affair. The third reason to run Death House is to arm them. And what do I mean by arm them? It is a semi-popular thing that some people do for this campaign, where level 1 PCs, or whatever level PCs, show up to the lands of Barovia. Instead of them showing up with their gear, they show up naked, except for literally just the clothing that they have on their back. No weapons, no armor, no gear, no nothing. If you run the Naked and Afraid approach to Curse of Strahd, Having them show up to Death House and arming themselves, not only with the gear, but also with gold, is a fun time. Because if they start off with literally nothing, then that's great. Then they start looking around. Okay, we find that sword. Okay, we find that spear. We use improv weapons. Oh, hey, we're going to use this as an improvised backpack. We're going to pick up every little gold piece because we need to outfit ourselves when we finally get out of here. That is a way you can approach this campaign, and I certainly recommend it. I've ran it like that multiple times. The fourth reason to run Death House is to tell an interesting tale. This is not a full-blown novel that you're going to give to your players. This is more just a world-building quest on your players show up to this house, they slowly uncover what's going on here as they climb up and climb down all the way through, that there were some bad things that went on here, and when they get to that grand finale, it finally reveals itself to what's going on. That is a fun, emergent way to tell a story. And for the fifth and final reason why you would choose to run Death House in this campaign is if your players love dungeons and if they love challenges. The book does suggest that you run this as a level 1 party, but you can ramp it up if you want to. You could make this a higher level, level 2 or level 3, maybe even more if you wanted to. And then it is a air quo fair engagement that they have to go up against, all these baddies and whatever else. Then it's more survivable. But it's more along the lines of if your players love combat and they love challenges and they love overcoming them, then for sure, Death House is a great way to challenge them. Because through the lands of Barovia, they could theoretically show up to places where they're way too low leveled and absolutely get dunked on, or they show up to places and they're way too high level and dunk on the enemy. 
this is a great way to maybe temper their expectations. Now I'm gonna go over some reasons why you might not wanna run this. One, because you don't like killing PCs. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you right here, if you run this for level one PCs, people are gonna die. Unless they are given a whole bunch of ample potions and not actually, not even, because the Shambling Mound can actually one-shot people as well. You know, it really just comes down to, if you don't wanna kill PCs, then this is definitely not the one for you. Second reason not to run this is because it doesn't actually pertain to the rest of the adventure. As written, nothing really happens, but you can have it. You can have there be some connection to the rest of the world. You can have it where if they take the deed and go over to the windmill, then maybe that has some actually magical property to it. You can have it where people actually know about the Durst family. You can have all these things in there, but you have to work for it. Or more importantly, you can go ahead and look up online all these other awesome people's guides on how to implement it into the rest of the campaign. Three, because it's dark. Now, of course, there is the big old trigger warning of children dying, and then, of course, the trigger warning of potential suicide and whatever else. Those things are pretty hairy for some groups and may not be appreciated. But beyond just those things, there is the fact that this place is just pretty oppressive. Your players trudge all the way up and then trudge all the way down, fighting all these undead and getting destroyed by mimics and then whatever the frick else, and then they go up against that shambling mound. It is just dark. It is very, very not fun for some groups, especially the very end at the chase, because as your players destroy it and they try to get out of the house, your players could theoretically die. In fact, I've actually ran this where some people have died as they're running out because of the saw blades and because of the poison and because of all of that other stuff. It is very, very dark and is not for every single group. Number four on why you might not run this is because you want to just get to those higher levels because you hate levels one and two. Perfectly reasonable, I know a lot, a lot of groups simply just hand wave level 1 and 2 because they think it's boring, because they don't like the lack of abilities, because they don't like how low the HP is, and this just doesn't serve any purpose for what people want out of the game. Perfectly fine, you know, just start off Curse of Strahd at whatever level you see fit, and just land them in the lands of Barovia, and problem solved. And 5, and this is a big one, Dungeon Fatigue. So you could theoretically run Death House as a one shot if your group is going, going, going. But unfortunately, I've heard many a group that take their time, where they make this game come to a grinding halt because they are deathly afraid, where they check every single little room and they try and find all the little traps and when it comes to combat, they try and think as strategically as possible because they don't want to die and they just take up so much time. I've heard some games of Death House taking as many as four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10 sessions and I truly do believe you will get absolute dungeon fatigue running it that long. So that's definitely something you got to consider depending on the kind of group that you have when running this adventure. Now if you do decide to run Death House, you have to be willing to throw them some bones in some places. And I do mean not only the literal bones of the children but also the metaphorical bones here because you do have to allow your players to explore a bit. If they get stuck, specifically if they cannot find the attic, then you're going to have to tell them, okay, as you search around, someone stumbles into something, and bam, wouldn't you know it, you totally know that there's a secret door right there that leads up to the attic. You have to be willing to do that, because if they don't, then people are just going to be crawling around being like, what the heck's going on? Another thing to consider, too, is if you are running Death House, you need to prepare them for what's to come. Not necessarily with gear or equipment or anything, but you just need to prepare them for the fact that this place is scary and this place is dark, and you need to prepare them for the fact that, hey, if you are running a game where PC death is regular, then hey, <laughs> it's gonna happen. But to really kick off Death House, we have to railroad our players into it. As your players are making their way through the mist of Barovia, then bam, there's literally one feature that they can see. They can see this house, they can't see anywhere else, and they slowly see the mist creeping around, and if they get stuck in the mist, then they start choking. This is going to railroad our players to getting to this adventure, and then, of course, things are going to kick off with the kids, Rose and Thorn. We're going to lead our players into the house, and that's when the truly terrible stuff's going to happen. They're going to explore around the first floor, and on the first floor, they're not going to find anything too fancy. Well, actually, they do. They actually find all the fancy bits here, but they don't find anything truly interesting. It's not until they get to the second floor where they can find something more interesting. 
because on the second floor they could potentially find that secret doorway which leads to some pretty interesting results not only will your players find some cool little items and stuff but they also help flesh out the world with this letter my most pathetic servant i am not your messiah sent to you by the dark powers of this land you know reading that message full on out your players are going to be wondering what the heck is going on here and if they do find this treasure out one they got a cool bunch of treasure but two far more importantly is the fact that they will walk away with a bit of knowledge they will know that hey we know that strad von zarovich is worshipped to some degree what's going on with that you know your players are probably showing up to curse of strad knowing that the adventure is called curse of strad so they're gonna know that hey strad there's obviously something there but what is that connection? They're going to have to figure that out one later on. On the third floor is truly where the player's worlds can get rocked. As at level 1 they could potentially be going up against an animated armor. Which has an 18 AC. A level 1 adventure at best is traditionally going to have a plus 5 to their hit. Meaning you got to roll a 13 just to hit the thing. Which is already not good. And even when you do hit it, guess what? It's got a ton of health. So it's going to take a bunch of hits. This thing can easily kill a bunch of PCs if it just beats them up themselves or pushes people off the balcony or whatever. It's going to kill a bunch of people. The animated broom could potentially kill people. It's definitely not killed any of my PCs, but it's knocked people out. But the specter, of course, is the big deal. That specter right there hits someone hard, and if they fail that con save, they're out of there. It's not a good time. But the third floor is nothing compared to the basement, which they will go to once they finally find out that there's an attic. They go up in the attic, and then they talk to the ghost kids, and then they plunge down in the basement to fight the monster. So while upstairs, they didn't have any actual way to travel. They'd only just go up the stairs, and then they could just go to wherever doors they want. Right here, they are immediately given several options on where to go. They, do they want to go left, or do they do want to go right? And that is going to lead to different results on where they explore around. If they do start exploring around, they can find some goodies. There's a whole bunch of gold floating around here. But unfortunately for them, there's a bunch of mini monsters as well. They can go up against a swarm of centipedes. They can go up against a grick. They'll get ambushed by a whole bunch of ghouls. They could be ambushed by a whole bunch of shadows. They can be attacked by the mimic. They can be attacked by the ghast. These things are going to absolutely destroy parties. But the funny part is that is all just theoretically optional. Your players could just skip right down to those doors there and, you know, just make their way down. No problem. But there might be a problem because there's a trap right there with a spike pit. And that spike pit could kill some PCs. And once your players make their way down, they'll see this weird macabre showcasing of a whole bunch of items. They go through these cells and then they'll finally find a secret door that leads them right in there. And then they'll hear the chanting from above, they step on the dais, and they'll hear the chanting, one must die. So unfortunately, as written, this basically means that some PC is going to have to die, usually. But there is the possibility that some PC has a pet on them, like the rat from the thief background, and then the uh, whatever pets someone might have, like from a ranger or whatever. But typically, people aren't going to be willing to kill those things. So what ends up happening, the good majority of the time is no one gets sacrificed and then bam, they go up against a shambling mound. I strongly do think that you should give them something here, specifically a dog. So the dog is a very common thing in the Curse of Strahd community, the dog is known as Lancelot. Me personally, I named that dog Merlin. So we put a dog here and we put it in area maybe 24 or 25, we have a dog. And this is a cute dog, and unlike anything else in this place, the dog is going to be cute and lick the party and just smile and be happy. And if anybody can actually talk to the dog, the dog's going to be cheery and delightful and say, yeah, let's go, friend. And that dog right there can prove as the catalyst for your players being able to sacrifice something. Once again, they may not be willing to sacrifice their poor dog, but if they do, then... I guess props to them, they avoid a shambling mound fight, but guess what, they're terrible people and you can hold that against them forever. For reference, I have both played and DM'd Death House multiple times now, and I'm thinking back on it, and yeah, at least at some point someone's died to pretty much every engagement. Uh, I distinctly remember when I was a player, those, uh, those ghouls in particular killed some people, and then I remember the Mimic killing someone. Last time I just ran this, the Mimic actually killed two PCs. Pretty crazy. 
You know, <laughs> these fights right here in particular, just clumps of back-to-back -back fights at low levels where you've got no abilities, you hit really weakly, and you've got no hit dice to work with, so you get hit once and then you're just pretty much down HP until you can get a long rest. But guess what? That long rest is something that we also need to talk about. So nowhere in the text does it actually say what happens if your players take a long rest. It doesn't say if the ghosts come to bug them again, it doesn't say if they get attacked or whatever. What I personally have done and always recommend is never allow long rest in dungeons because it just doesn't make any sense and it kind of throws off the pace of the game. If your players get up into one little scrape, one little boo-boo, then they're always willing to just stay there. So one, if you do go with the naked and afraid approach, then hey, they are going to be not able to take a long rest anyway because they don't have any food or water. So they need to get through here before they just, you know, starve and die out, right? But if your players do have resources on them, if they've got those supplies, then you're probably going to have to threaten them with something. Say that they hear scurrying in the walls, say that they hear a groaning of the wood, and if this continues on, then something bad may happen. Maybe if they are resting up in one of the rooms up there in the top, then smoke begins to billow out of the fireplace and start to choke them, meaning that they cannot get a long rest. If your players are super duper persistent, then maybe you do have to have a whole bunch of rats swarm the party and you can tell your players yeah as you continue to sit there then you can hear more scurrying what do you do it may get to that extreme but you know it really comes down to the kind of game that you're running as always are you running a game where death is likely are you running a game where death is not likely are you running a game that is a hardcore combat mode engage or are you running a game where combat is sport now, after your players have trudged their way through this veritable death house, they may have sacrificed something and then the cult is appeased and they can walk out absolutely no issue. But if they did not sacrifice anything because they aren't heartless evil people, then of course they get in that fight of the Shambling Mound, which is absolutely ridiculous. Level 1 PCs are going to take absolute ages to kill a thing. And if you are running it where they get infected with madness and disease and death curses and whatever else after PCs die, then people are going to be racking those things up because... You know, level 2 PCs at this point, really, really not that good. <laughs> they're hidden for whatever their damage is. It's not that great, and they got no spell slots and whatever else. It's a really, really bad time. But if they do manage to kill a thing or they just run out, then they are going to be up against a whole bunch of terrible nonsense as they run out of the death house. All the windows are bricked up. All the doors are gone, and now there's saw blades, which are going to do 2d10 slashing damage. Those things kill PCs. Then every room of the fireplace has the fire going, and they have to make con saves or take 1d10 poison. And then all the interiors are rotten, and if you fail these athletics checks, then bam, swarm rats come out and attack. Running out of death house is actually even more deadly than some of the combat encounters in the entirety of this place. It says keep track of the initiative, as you should, because it, may, it should make them feel like they're on time pressure. But it doesn't actually make us feel like there is any time pressure here. You could give them the ultimatum and say, hey, the house is going to collapse in five rounds, go. You, you could say something as simple as that. But if you don't want to have any sort of that meta talk at the table, then you just have to present them and say, hey, this house is crumbling right now. And you see that if you do not get out of here soon, you are going to die. Now, as your players rush out of the death house there, they emerge right there at E7. But the thing is, is it's a little bit odd to me. I personally like always moving death house outside of the village. And then your players walk up into the village. Because then people are going to know what's going on, right? People are going to hear that stuff. People are going to know that stuff. And I think that it just sort of seems out of place to have the death house in the village of Barovia itself. Maybe it could literally just be right off the map right there, just a few feet away. But making sure that it's not just a house in the middle of the town. I think that's probably one of the better ways to go about it. Death House certainly does live up to its name. It has claimed many a PC in our lifetimes throughout the entirety of this campaign. We've got so many horror stories of PCs dying left, right, and center, TPKs galore, and a whole bunch of other crazy shenanigans. It's just bound to happen. Low-level games are pretty deadly, and obviously Death House is designed to kill PCs. It's just what it's there for. So as I said earlier in the video, yeah, it makes sense that not everyone's going to be running this thing. It just makes sense. 
I run it for my games because I run a bit more hardcore games. And at the same time, I also allow for PCs to be resuscitated. And heck, next time I run this, I'm probably going to do a death funnel approach where I give them a whole bunch of low-level PCs or maybe those survivors from Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft and then have them run through and see who survives. I think that could be a fun time. It really comes down to the kind of game that you're trying to run. Now, I think the vanilla approach of running it as written is perfectly acceptable. I think there's a lot of great things to be gleaned from it. But I know, I know dang well, a lot of people are going to say, Oh, what about the Mandy Mod, or the Dragna Carta, or the LBH, or whatever the case may be. Whoever is rendition of it you want to run, that's perfectly fine. Just make sure that it fits in line with the kind of game that you want to run. Because, honestly, that is the biggest issue I think that there is with Death House, is the fact that it is so strangely unique to the rest of the campaign. No other part of the campaign has that sense of combat and that sense of claustrophobia and that sense of storytelling. It stands out completely on its own. And some people don't like the fact that it's weird. It, it's sort of a tonality change between the rest of the adventure. I think that if you don't like that, you should definitely change it up, whether you remove it entirely or you change up the story a bit or you have it continue on to the rest of the campaign, whether they have to go out into the world and come back to the death house multiple times, or if the death house is a much bigger place, or, oh, your players can, you know, make a deal and make the death house uh, livable again. There's a lot of different ways you can go about doing it, of course, but what I always recommend with everything is just make it your own. Make that death house come to life for you. <laughs> death house come to life. <laughs> So I'm curious to hear what your guys' approach to Death House is. Are you guys going to run it as is, or are you going to take it out completely? Are you going to run someone else's rendition of it, or are you going to just completely go off the rails and make your own thing? Are your players going to be able to claim the windmill as their own if they get that deed, or are they just going to deal with a whole bunch of hags that want to keep it for themselves? And will Rose and Thorn actually be put at ease or are your players going to forget to put the bones in the crypts and then leave the house forever? Go ahead and tell me all those things because I would love to hear it. But that's going to do it for me. Thank you for watching. Thanks for listening. And thank you to my amazing patrons. You guys are absolutely incredible. Thank you so very much. And I cannot wait to see you all in the next one.